In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Most Holy God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it is most fitting that we begin our program tonight in your name, for it is about you and your loving concern for us that we have come to hear. It is a delight to our souls to realize that even though we are not worthy, you have chosen us to be the beneficiaries of your plan of salvation, the plan which reached its culmination in the Holy Catholic Church, which you built, married, and is your very body, Lord Jesus, and through which you offer to mankind the fullness of saving truth, the means to holiness, and your very flesh and blood for food and drink, that we may have life. And in your unceasing goodness to us, Lord, your grace has led us to be here tonight, that we might be further instructed in these wonderful matters. We thank you, Lord, that you have brought to us a worthy teacher, a man who has given himself over to probing deeply into your truths, a scholar who, in dedicating himself to your holy church, loves truth and hates falsehood. We ask your continuing blessings on Dr. St. Genis, Lord, especially when he has met with adversity in his efforts to preach the gospel. We are reminded, dearest Lord, particularly in this Lenten season, that we must forgive those who do us wrong. Help us to do so, we pray. And help us as well in true Christian charity to try to correct those who have been misinformed respecting our holy Catholic faith. May St. Cyril of Jerusalem, whose feast Holy Mother Church celebrates this day, guide Dr. Son Genis in his presentation tonight. Blessed be God forever, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to uh, make a, just a few quick comments why we're meeting here instead of at the Knights of Columbus Hall tonight. Uh, first off, uh, this is a disclaimer. This is not sponsored by Council 4480. It is sponsored by certain members of our council, me included. Uh, and uh, the police department was very kind to offer us this building tonight. I'd like to thank uh, worthy Grand Knight, Bruce Ewing, if you would stand up for your presence here tonight. And worthy Deputy Grand Knight, who is outside, we all need to forgive. This is the Lenten season. Whatever has transpired, uh, pray for those people. We will pray for them. And I, I've talked to the diocese. They're praying for us. So this is going to work. God brings good out of things that happen sometimes in our lives. He rides straight with perfect lines. Uh, I'd like to make a few comments. Um, first, a disclaimer. Uh, any comments uh, that the speaker makes are Dr. Sejanis' comments. They aren't necessarily supported by me, any of the other people here, or the Knights of Columbus. There is um, there will be a question answer time at the end of each talk. Each talk will be approximately 40 minutes. We do have to stick to a time schedule tonight uh, because we do have to vacate the building on time. And uh, if uh, we have a visual recording by Brother Lawrence Gonzaga, uh, that is the only recording that will be allowed tonight. Uh, so please, uh, if you want to copy that, I'm sure Lawrence can make those available to you sometime in the future. Is that Adequate. Okay. Uh, Dr. Robert Sengenis is a uh, famous theologian and biblical scholar. Uh, he has several graduate degrees, including the Doctor of Philosophy and Theology and Scriptural Studies. I hope I have that correct. He's an author of at least eight books, uh, including several that are carried at El Carmelo Bookstore. Uh, not by Bread Alone, not by Faith Alone, not by Scripture Alone, to name three that I've seen over there. Um, he's also uh, been the subject of uh, included in a long chapter in Pat Madrid's book that we've sponsored here at, at the Knights of Columbus also called Surprise by Truth and Conversion of His Conversion from Protestantism to the Catholic Faith. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Robert Sengenis. time, it seems. Uh, we got to fit three topics in uh, 
two hours and 50 minutes. So we can do two real good ones. Two real good ones, okay. Well, um, <clears throat> I hope I last for three hours too because I have a very bad cold. I've had it for 10 days and uh, I wasn't actually going to come out uh, today, but uh, Lawrence twisted my arm to come out and uh, I felt I, I couldn't let him down and all you people I couldn't let down either. Uh, but pray for me uh, tonight, would you please, that uh, God will clear my head, because right now I feel like I'm talking inside of a tin can. That's how big my head is. <laughs> At any rate, um, I want to ta- uh, cover three topics tonight. Uh, one is uh, the apocalypse, and I think that would be a good uh, topic to start with, because I think a lot of you, as I was, uh, I wrote a book on this, 600 pages, uh, but, and actually before I wrote the book, I was uh, kind of puzzled as to how all the, fit all the pieces together of this truly amazing book. It's unlike any other book in the New Testament or even the Old Testament. And uh, it's been a puzzle to many people. So I figured, you know, we can spend a, about 40 minutes or so talking about that tonight just to give you a sort of a, you know, a, a quick 10 easy lesson uh, uh, study of this book. So at least you have some idea of what this uh, intriguing book is about. And then I want to cover another topic tonight um, about the Bible itself. Uh, You know, there's a lot of controversy today about uh, whether we should read the Bible, for example, when we go to Genesis and read about Adam and Eve and the flood and and the giants in those days and how they lived to 965 years. You know, is that all to be taken literally? Uh, or is it just a bunch of myth and metaphors and, and things like that? You see, that's a big question today. And it divides Catholics uh, right down the middle, as a matter of fact. Uh, so uh, I want to cover that a little bit with you. And uh, I also want to cover even a more controversial topic today. And that deals with, um, let's say, uh, the New Covenant and the Old Covenant. Uh, there's a lot of people today who believe that the Old Covenant back in the uh, Old Testament times with the Jewish people is still a valid covenant today for the Jewish people. And there's a lot of Catholics who teach that today. And uh, I have quite a different story to tell you. And uh, that's where a lot of this controversy is that you've been hearing about uh, that almost didn't get me here uh, these, uh, these days to teach you. But uh, nevertheless, I am here. And uh, what I want to do is give you the traditional teaching of the church. I also want to teach you from scripture. And I want to uh, tell you what our popes have taught and our councils have taught as well, and our catechisms on that very topic. And that will be the last topic of the night. And what I'm going to do is talk for like, uh, you say, 35, 40 minutes on a topic, and then we'll take about 10 or 15 minutes for questions. Okay? Sound like a good plan? Sure. All right. All right, well, let's deal with the apocalypse first. Has anybody read that recently, by the way? Show of hands? Wow, one, two, okay, three. All right. How far did you get? <laughs> Not very far, huh? Okay. Well, I'll try to make it simple for you today. And uh, then when I'm done, uh, giving you sort of the backbone, the general outlay of this book, you can go back and read it this week and see if what I've taught you tonight, you can apply it to what you've read and see if it is much more understandable to you. Okay? And those, that you, those of you who haven't read the Apocalypse, well, you'll have experienced the same thing. Okay, um, what do we know about the Apocalypse that's different than any other book in the New Testament? When, when you think about um, this, this intriguing book, why is it so difficult to understand, people believe? Why is it, here's the book that I wrote, by the way, uh, The Apocalypse of St. John, the Catholic Apologetic Study Bible. This is the second volume of our Study Bible series. And... Uh, this picture, by the way, comes from the uh, Shrine of the Immaculate Conception in Washington, D.C., in case anybody's ever been there. Very awesome uh, picture of Jesus coming back at the second coming. He looks a little angry there, don't you think? <laughs> you probably can't see it from there. Anyway, um, what is different about this book than any other book? Well, the Apocalypse of St. John is basically all symbolic. It, all, it uses metaphors, it uses... Uh, symbolic language. It talks about uh, a spirit with three frogs coming out of his throat. It talks about a woman who's a harlot riding on a beast in the sea. It talks about a dragon with ten horns. Uh, You know, all kinds of images are in this book, if you've read it. 
Uh, those three that have uh, read the Apocalypse recently, do you remember reading about those images at all? Yes. Okay. So um, the question is, why has God chosen to write this book in such a you know, perplexing way? Why not just tell us straight out? Well, here's a good reason. We all know what it's like to dream, do we not? We dream every night. And when we dream, what we're doing is we're re sort of reliving our day, or maybe a few days ago, or a few weeks ago, or even maybe a few years ago. We're reliving those experiences, and our subconscious mind is, is trying to deal with those conflicts that we had. And what it does is it can't talk in language like we talk. So it creates images. It creates images in our minds. And we dream those images. And as we all know, we'll wake up and we'll have these images floating in our mind. And, we're, and first thing we say to ourselves is, what does that mean? What does that mean? Why did I dream that image? You know? And the example I use in my book is, let's say you're being chased by a bunch of uh, men with axes in red suits. And they're chasing you, and you're just about to go off the cliff, and you wake up in your dream. That's happened to many of us, right? It's called a nightmare. <laughs> and somehow our body wakes up before we actually fall off the cliff. Uh, well, the first thing you ask yourself is, well, what do those men in the red suits with the axes represent? Logical question. Okay. Well, maybe, as I say in the book here, maybe you're having trouble at work. And those men in the red suits with the axes coming at you represent your boss who you think is going to fire you because of this bad work that you've done or because the company's not doing too well and you are worried because you're not going to have enough money to support your family, you see. So what your mind does to try to cope with this or try to understand it is it creates these images, you see, in the middle of the night. And you know best what these images represent because you live through it that same day, you see. Well, the apocalypse is more or less doing the same thing. There are certain truths that the Bible has given us through the Old and New Testaments, and then it puts these same truths. <coughs> I'm going to be doing that occasionally as we go through. Coughing. <coughs> and I'm going to need some water in case somebody wants to get me some. <coughs> The, uh, the uh, Apocalypse does the same thing, is it takes all these truths that we have in the Bible and it puts them in this symbolic language. Okay? <coughs> Excuse me. I bet you hope you're praying out there. At least I can get through this. <laughs> I need my throat to survive. Um, and so the question is, well, why would you put it in symbolic language? Why would you just not just tell it plainly? Well, there's a thir certain thing about symbolic language, even as your dreams have a certain significance. You remember them, don't you? Yeah, you re sometimes you can remember dreams for years on end. You could have had a dream 10 years ago, and you still remember that dream. Why? Because it's in these very horrific images that your mind created. And when we see horrific images, well, they stick in our mind. Thank you, sir. Same thing with the apocalypse. When you see these images, they stick in your mind, you see. And then you remember, well, yeah, well, that, that image that I read represents this gospel truth that I read back in John or Matthew or Genesis or whatever it is, you see. So God had a reason why he put the apocalypse in these symbolic images, okay? Because he wants us to remember them in a very special way. Now, apocalypse has 22 chapters. And there's something very significant about the apocalypse. It's built on the number seven. And the number seven, as probably most of us know, is a number that's used very frequently in the rest of the Bible as well. And it's a symbolic number. It's a number that God uses to signify perfection. Okay? And, wow, what better book to put it in? The last book of the Bible, the number seven, which I think is used 61 times. 
uh, in the last book of the Bible to sort of sum it all up. This is my perfect revelation to you, and I'm going to show you in a symbolic way by using this number seven so many times. I'm going to weave it in and out of this text to show you exactly the, the impact that this can have on you. Now, the number seven also appears throughout the flow of the book, not just by mentioning number seven. For example, if we could break down the apocalypse, we can do it into seven sections. The first section will be chapters one to three. <coughs> Second, let's see, you guys got cough too, huh? Second section will be chapters four to six. The third section will be chapter seven to nine. The fourth section will be chapters 10 and 11. The fifth section will be chapters 12 to 14. The sixth section will be chapters 15 to 19. And the seventh section will be chapters 20 to 22. Okay? Seven sections. Now, how do we know how to break those up into seven sections? We know how to break them up. Because each section, except for this one here, except it's interspersed here, each section ends with the second coming of Christ. Okay? Each section. Okay? So in other words, what the apocalypse is doing is telling us the same story over and over again in different ways. Okay? So here, you'll read chapter 6, for example, is the story about the, the four horsemen. That's one of the most popular images in the apocalypse, the four horsemen. Remember we were told back in the 60s that the Beatles were the four horsemen? Remember? Well, that's not true, by the way. Um, and then in chapter 9, you have another scene of Judgment Day, Christ coming back, second coming. Chapter 11, same thing. Chapter 14, same thing. Chapter 19, same thing. Chapter 22, the same thing. Okay? So, basically, if you know this, you know more than most people in the world about the apocalypse. But it's broken up into these seven sections, each with the second coming of Christ. Now, some people have had different interpretations throughout history. Okay? Some people believe that the apocalypse is chronological. That is, you start out, this will be the early period of history, and this will be sort of the middle period, and this will be what I'm getting toward the end. Okay? And they actually will give you different times in history that they believe uh, occurred in a certain chapter. Like they believe that the, uh, the locusts represent the Protestant Reformation. Okay? Now, that may or may not be true. I'm not going to say. Well, no, the locusts don't represent the Protestant Reformation. I just don't take it that far. Because I've learned with the apocalypse that sometimes the more detail you get into trying to focus on a particular point in history, the more trouble you're going to get into. Because that means you're going to have to find a, rep a historical representation for every symbol in the apocalypse. And that's kind of hard to do. And it's kind of hard to do to get it chronologically straight as well. And you'll see a lot of those theories that begin to fall apart when they run out of historical events to fit in the symbols of the apocalypse, you see. So what we do here is, and uh, this started with St. Augustine back, it's not my idea, it started back, you know, uh, many centuries ago, is you take a more general look at the apocalypse, okay, and you try to apply uh, uh, certain things that you know about how the gospel penetrates into history, in each one of these sections. And therefore, it's, it remains general and you don't have to get bogged down with too many details, okay? Now, before we move any further, one thing I want to say is in the Apocalypse, chapter 20 is the most important chapter in the whole book. And that is because chapter 20 talks about the thousand years. Has anybody ever heard that uh, mentioned it all, the thousand years, Christ will reign for a thousand years. A lot of our Protestant brethren talk about this. The millennium, uh, some people believe that when Christ comes back, he's going to rule in Jerusalem, and he's going to rule for a millennium, a thousand years, you see. 
And before he comes back, there's going to be a rapture. Uh, where the Christians are taken out of the world. Have you ever see those bumper stickers that says, in case of rapture, this car will be unmanned? And we used to have those a lot in the 70s and 80s. You don't see them around too much more. But anyway, that's what they're talking about. Uh, there's a certain theory that uh, before the thousand years, the Christians are going to be taken out of the world, and, and uh, then the, the unbelievers are here. They're going to be uh, 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 in judgment, and Christ is going to come back after that. At any rate... Um, Chapter 20 is very important because when you dis establish the chronological point where you're going to place chapter 20, that determines the interpretation of the rest of the book of the Apocalypse. Okay? And there's three basic interpretations you can give for chapter 20. What do you do with a thousand years? Do you place it in the future? Do you place it in the present? Or do you place it in the past? Those are your three options, basically. Okay, now those that believe in the rapture, as I said, you know, where Christ is going to uh, rapture the believers out of the world, and then He's going to reign on Jerusalem for a thousand in, for a thousand years. Well, that's that's the future application of a thousand years. Okay, now there's some people that believe that the thousand years of, of uh, Apocalypse 20 began in the past, and they begin with the reign of David in 1000 A.D. or right right around 1000 A.D. And they say that that 1,000 year period transpired from David, King David, up until the time of Christ, when Christ was born. That seems plausible. Okay? It's 1,000 years. All right? You got you know, King David, who's a symbol of Christ, coming uh, before the, the actual Christ. Okay? That's plausible. Okay? The other option is to say that the 1,000 years is in the present time. You were in the millennium. You were in the 1,000 years, you see. And that the 1,000 years started when Christ came at his first coming, okay, and will transpire until he comes for his second coming. Now some of you are scratching your head and say, well, isn't that more than a thousand years? <laughs> yes. Now they used to think, those that held this theory, that one possible fulfillment of it was, yeah, that Christ will come back in 1000 AD. Okay? And of course he didn't come back then. And so they said, well, Perhaps it's symbolic, like the rest of the apocalypse, you see? And so that's where we have the symbolic interpretation of the thousand years. It's not a literal thousand years. It's a symbolic period of time as the number thousand or a hundred or ten or whatever denomination of one with a few zeros after it symbolizes in the Bible the completeness of time. Okay? So, <coughs> excuse me. So those are our three options. Now, which one did the Catholic Church pick? Anybody have a gander? The present. Did you pick the present? Now, who picked that for us? <coughs> who picked it for us? Well, it began with St. Augustine. Okay? And that was more or less conferred by the Council of Ephesus. Not that this is infallible. Okay? But this is the historic uh, interpretation that the Church gave to the Apocalypse. The thousand years is not the future. Okay? As a matter of fact, the Catholic Church more or less came out against any application of the thousand years to the future. Uh, that's a, 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 an idea called Chileism. And Pius XII, Pope Pius XII, said that the Catholic Church uh, thought that Chileism, that is a future application of the thousand years of Apocalypse 20, was not correct. Okay? Now, you didn't say that the past one like from David to the first coming of Christ, was wrong. Okay. So that leaves that option open. All right. But the Catholic Church did say more or less, not infallibly, but formally and officially, that uh, the thousand years that they were going to interpret from Apocalypse 20 was a present one, that is, from the first coming of Christ to the second coming of Christ. So that's why you see me, as I <clears throat> divide the Apocalypse into seven sections, each one of the seven sections ends with the second coming of Christ. And so where's the beginning? You think, where, where do you think the beginning is? If the, if the end is at the second, where's the beginning? First. The first, right. Okay, so that's what we would fill, fill in here. You'll see at each point in the beginning of these sections, this is the first coming of Christ, okay? 
And what I'm going to do for you tonight is I'm going to show you how to look for those symbols. So that you can say, when you go read it yourself tonight or this week, you can say, ah, yeah, I see. Yeah, there's the first coming of Christ. Or there's the second coming of Christ. I can see that. And you'll be able to see all these little sim these uh, little <coughs> kind of, uh, I don't know what call them, uh, signposts, sort of like, uh, that I'll give you to look for these things. Now let's just do, do this. Does anybody have a Bible with them? They can uh, read for me? Because I don't have one right now. Okay, Bob. We'll turn to, to Apocalypse chapter 20 for me. Okay, you got it? Okay, we'll read the first three verses. Read it nice and loud so we can And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan had bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till a thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Now, I'm going to have, have you read that again for me slowly. Read the first sentence, or first verse, I'm sorry, again. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Okay, I'm going to read again. Go ahead. Again? You keep No, read the next line after that. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him. Okay. All right. So now we have to figure out if we're saying that the beginning of Apocalypse 20 is the first coming of Christ, well, how are we going to apply this symbolic language that we just read to the first coming of Christ? You see? Well, let's think back in the Gospels, for example. When Jesus is dealing with the disciples, he sends the disciples out in Luke chapter 10. He sends them out two by two, the 70 disciples. Okay? And they come back. What did they say to Jesus when they came back? They said, Jesus, even the demons listen to our voice. We cast them out. And at the mention of your name, these things are done. We heal the sick. We see demons cast out of people. And what does Jesus say to them <clears throat> in Luke verse 10, 18? He says, and I saw, I saw Satan fall as lightning from heaven. As the apostles are mentioning that they had the power to cast out demons, heal people, Jesus says, and I saw Satan fall as lightning from heaven. You see. Okay? So here we have an indication, as we just read in Apocalypse 20, what's happening when this angel comes down and puts a chain on Satan and puts him in the bottomless pit. You see? He's falling. And he's going down. Okay? So here we have some some graphic language now to apply to the symbolic language that we just read. Okay? Let's read another passage. Excuse me. Um, John chapter 12, verse 31. Whoever can get to that quickest can read it for us. And um, the next passage is John chapter 16, verse 11. If someone else can get that passage. And another passage would be Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Someone can get that passage. So, who's got the first passage? Go ahead, man. John 12, 31. Now is the time of judgment on this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. Okay, you see that? Jesus is just about to go to the cross. John 12. John 12. John, the whole Gospel of John is written toward the end of Jesus' ministry. Jesus is talking to his disciples. Now the prince of this world will be cast out. Cast out at where? We're going to find out where in a minute. Okay, we do know where he's going to the bottomless pit, according to Apocalypse 20. Okay, John 16:11. Anybody get that one? I got it. Go ahead. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. Okay, he's now going to be judged, which means before he wasn't judged. Now, when Jesus is going to the cross, he's going to be judged. Okay, Hebrews 2:14. Anybody find that one? Hebrews 2:14. Therefore, because the children are partakers of the flesh and blood, he also himself in like manner hath been partaker of the same, that through death he might destroy him who had empire of death. That is to say, the devil. Okay. He says um, that Jesus, when he died, 
destroyed the power of the devil, basically is what Hebrews 2.14 says. Okay? So here we have the string of passages, Luke 10.18, John 12.31, John 16.11, Hebrews 2.14. There's other ones. Jude uh, verse 6, 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 4, uh, Colossians 3.18. I mean, there's all kinds of them that show us that when Christ went to the cross, Satan's power was, he was bound. He was cast out. He was thrown to the bottomless pit. A chain was put around. This is all symbolic language. That something is happening to Satan's power. Okay? Now, Bob, let's go back to uh, chapter 12 of the Apocalypse. Okay? And we'll read what's going on there. And I want you to see how similar that is to chapter 20. Okay? Go ahead, Bob. At the start? Yeah, at the, verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns <coughs> upon his head. Keep going. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and it cast them unto the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth the man child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Keep going. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she had a place prepared of God, that she should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. Keep going. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil. And Satan, which deceives the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. One more verse. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength. In the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Okay, now you see that. Okay, he says the accuser of our brethren is cast out from heaven. There was a war going on between the good angels and the bad angels. Okay, this is all real. Okay, this is all actually happened. As fanciful as it might seem to some of us. Uh, but, but he lost that war. He was cast out of heaven. And he was cast down onto the earth. And the last verse that he read, he says, Now is come salvation and the power of the kingdom of our God. Well, that's what happened when Jesus went to the cross, you see. Okay? He's saying the same thing that Hebrews 2.14 told us. That when Christ went to the cross, he destroyed the power of the devil. Okay? In what way did he destroy the power of the devil? Does that mean the devil can't do anything today? No. Remember, this is all symbolic language. He's got a chain on him. He doesn't have the power of death anymore. In other words, he can't hold us and consign us to hell anymore because Christ has won the victory of the cross and give us has given us salvation, you see. So that's the victory that we have. It's salvation. It's not that our life is going to be hunky-dory now, that all our problems are going to be solved right now. That won't come until the future, the second coming of Christ, you see. The first coming has to set it up in which the salvation of our souls is achieved, then the salvation of our bodies will occur at the second coming of Christ. And all glorious, what did they think that's going to be, huh? When we get our new bodies and live with Christ in heaven forever. Right now, it's just our soul. It's sort of like the deposit. That's, is that, that's exactly what St. Paul calls it. This is the, the deposit. Like you were going to the bank to make a deposit. God made a deposit in your soul by giving you a new life in your soul that you can recognize all this that we're talking about in anticipation for the full redemption, he says, at the end of time when he comes back in glory. Hallelujah. Okay, so we see that uh, chapter 12 and chapter 20 are very similar. Okay? Now, Bob, I want you to read chapter 6. 6. six. This is going to talk about the four horsemen that we talked about before. Okay? Notre Dame for him, Carson. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Therefore, leaving the principal doctrine of Christ, let us go on into perfection, 
not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and a faith. No, wait a minute, wait a minute. Go into the apocalypse. Oh, I'm in Hebrews. <laughs> <laughs> when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts saying, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked and beheld a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and Hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth, to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. Keep going. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, and for the testimony which they held. Okay. Good. Thank you, Bob. All right. So what he just read was... A succession of horses coming out in different colors. Okay? And I didn't have him read it yet, but if you read the rest of that chapter, what he would read is about earthquakes and, and things like that. As a matter of fact, Bob, why don't you just go ahead and uh, read verses uh, 11 to the end. And, uh, okay. And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. And behold, when I opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as a sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it was rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. The okay, you can stop the there. And the great men and the rich men, and the chief captains and the mighty men, and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. Okay, Bob. Thank you. All right, so what does that sound like? You see, the, it says here, the uh, sky is rolled up as a scroll, the stars are falling from the sky, uh, what else? We have earthquakes. I mean, what does that sound like to you? It sounds like the world's coming to an end, right? Literally. Okay, well that is exactly what's happening in that chapter. Okay, at the end of, of uh, Apocalypse 6, and that makes sense, of course, because what happens after the world comes to an end? Well, Christ comes back for the second coming, you see. Okay, so that all makes sense, doesn't it? But we're more interested in what's happening right before that. Those are the previous verses that Bob read, verses 1 to 10. Okay, and they talk about these four horses. All right, so let's break these horses down. What's happening in each of these things? Well. Uh, I'm not going to have Bob read it again, but basically the white horse comes out with a bow and comes out with a gospel, okay? He's the symbol of Jesus coming with the gospel, okay? He comes out, as it says, conquering and to conquer. He's going to conquer, basically, the devil's dominion. The devil has had this world up in some, from the time of Adam, when he made Adam sin, to the time of Christ. That's all going to come to an end right now. Okay? So the white horse comes with the gospel. The red horse comes and he tries to upset the gospel. Okay? It's the anti gospel. So Satan still works, you see. And that's why the New Testament tells us that Satan roams as a roaring lion, 1 Peter 5 8. Or 2 Corinthians 11. 13 and 14 says that Satan transforms himself into an apostle of light, a messenger of righteousness, you see, to deceive us. That's his game, to deceive us. That's what he did with Adam and Eve in the garden, and the same thing continues throughout history. He works by deception, because he can't force you to do things, you see. He can't break your will in the sense that 
he can say, I'm going to you know, make you do this. You have a free will. And so the only way he can get you to do things is by deceiving you into you making the choice yourself. And he's very good at that. He's a master deceiver. Okay? So that's when he comes. And he comes, he doesn't look like a, a devil with a red suit and a forked tail. No, he comes looking just like Christ. As close as he can get to Christ, that's what he will look like. Why? Because that's the best way to deceive you, you see. And that's why we need a church. Because the church is the one that gives us the information we need to discern between the true gospel and the false gospel. Okay? All right? That's why the church is so important. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 16, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Well, why did he say that? Well, these are the gates of hell right here, you see. And they're coming against the gates of heaven, trying to break their way in. All right? And our church, built on the solid rock, is the very thing that stops this gospel, this anti-gospel, from overtaking the true gospel. Okay? Now, we will read <coughs> later on in uh, chapter 11, for example, that there is a breakage that occurs here. The seepage, let's say. The doors are still there. Okay? But there comes a time where this anti-gospel gets even stronger and stronger toward the end, when Christ is just about to come back. And St. Paul told us about that <coughs> Excuse me, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He says, There will come a time in history where the man of sin will be revealed. And he will come and set himself in the temple, placing himself there in the temple and calling himself God and, and requiring worship. And then chapter or verse 9 says, And he will come with false signs and lying wonders, that is, miracles to deceive people. You see. So there will come a time, the Bible warns us, where this anti-gospel will be even stronger than it is today. And he will give, it's called in um, Apocalypse 20, uh, as a matter of fact, Bob, would you read that for us? The uh, verse 3 of Apocalypse 20. I to keep making the turn pages here, but somebody's got to be my page turn tonight. Verse 3? Yeah. <coughs> Cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Ah, uh, come, you see that? You see. He's going to be sealed for this thousand year period. So right before it's over, he's going to be loosed for a little season, you see. And so that's going to come at, toward the end. It, we, we, we're probably not in it right yet, but it will come. That's, that's, and that's the warning Paul gives us. When you see that happening, you know that Jesus is right at the very doors, ready to come back. Okay? Now, as this anti gospel goes out, Who's, who's caught in the, midst, uh, in the midst of all this, you know, the, with, the, with the gospel and the anti-gospel fighting each other? Well, it's you and I, you see. We're the victims here, all right? And this anti-gospel wants to capture souls for itself and take them to hell just as much as the gospel wants to capture souls for itself and take them to heaven. It's a war. It's a, it's a classic battle going on, and it's been going on ever since time began. And it's not going to stop until Christ comes back, you see. So you and I are caught right in the middle of it, all right? So that's why he then talks about the black horse, you see. And if it happens that we, you and I, who are caught in the middle here, okay, here we are. We're caught in the middle here, and we start listening to this anti-gospel more than we listen to the gospel, well then... God says he's going to come in judgment. And that's what that black horse represents. Okay? He's going to come in judgment. And all kinds of things are going to happen to us, as Bob read. There's going to be famine. There's going to be pestilence. There's going to be, you know, disasters. There's going to be, uh, well, one important aspect of what he read was that uh, if you read, um, I think it's... Uh, uh, verses uh, 7 and 8 again, if you would do that for me. Uh, Apocalypse chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. Chapter 6? Yeah, verses 7 and 8. And this will relate to uh, something that we're going through today, as a matter of fact. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth be saved. Come and see. 
and looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat upon him was Death. Now, uh, read before that. Uh, try uh, 5 and 6, verse 5 and 6. And when he opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and that he sat on him, and had a pair of balances in his hand. Balances, okay, keep going. And I heard the voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. See, thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Okay. Well, basically, what it's saying there is uh, a penny is a denarius in those days, and a denarius was a full day's pay. And so he's saying that God's bringing judgment to the point where it's going to take a whole day's wage to buy just enough food for you to eat. You're not going to have anything left over. No luxuries, no nothing. Okay? It's going to be a famine, basically. You're just going to have just enough to survive. Okay? That's God's judgment. Okay? And if you don't listen to this after he brings this judgment, then the next horse comes. That's the pale horse. Go ahead and read that again, bud. And I looked and beheld a pale horse, and his name that sat upon him was Death, and hell followed with him. Okay. That's all we need to read. Okay? That's it. God's going to give you a certain time to respond to his judgments. If you don't, then the pale horse comes. Now, if you do respond to his judgments, then we go right back up here, you see. The black horse is taken away, basically, and now it's this the white horse versus the red horse. And we have everything we need to fight the red horse, you see. That's what the New Testament tells us. We have everything we need. We have our church. We have graces. We have the sacraments. We have the Bible. We have teachers. Everything we, we need is here for us to continue this battle, okay? Now... Uh, I don't have time to do any more. But that sort of just whets your appetite for what we're dealing with in the apocalypse. Okay? Now what I'll do right now is I'll take, um, say, uh, five or ten minutes for questions, and then we'll go right on to our next topic. Okay. Yes, Bob? What's the role of, I think it's Enoch and Elijah uh, that lay dead in the streets of Jerusalem? Yeah. Now, uh, there's been different interpretations of that, I will admit, okay? And that comes in uh, chapter 11. It's not, Enoch and Elijah's name are not mentioned in that chapter. There's a description, however, that seems to fit at least Elijah, possibly Enoch. Some other interpreters thought, well, maybe it's Jeremiah, okay? So, this is where I say it's not good to get bogged down in uh, assigning a particular person to that. It's better to look at the general teaching of the passage, okay? The general teaching of that passage in Apocalypse 11, now, re now remember, it's near the second coming of Christ. So we can expect something very similar to what we read over here, and something to very similar to what we're reading over here, and also chapter 12, okay? So what we do read is we, the two witnesses are lying in the street, dead. Now who are the two witnesses? Well, the two witnesses are those who preach the gospel. That's the symbolism that he's giving us there. Okay? They've preached the gospel for 1260 days. Okay? Now, that 1260 days is a symbolic period of time. And the reason it says days is because we're preaching the gospel on a daily basis. Okay? And I, I can't get into 1260 right now. I can show you the symbolism of that in the book. It has it all laid out there for you. But the basic gist of that chapter is these two witnesses preach the gospel, then they're killed, and they lie in the street of Jerusalem. Okay. Now, it doesn't say the word Jerusalem. It says they lie in that street uh, named Sodom and Gomorrah, where our Lord was crucified. Well, wait a minute. I thought our Lord was crucified in Jerusalem. But this chapter says it's Sodom and Gomorrah, where our Lord was crucified. Well, what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that things have gotten pretty bad. In this struggle between the gospel and the anti-gospel, things have gotten pretty bad where this Satan is loose for his little season and he actually kills these witnesses, you see. Okay? And you can get the rest of the detail in the book. Okay? Uh, yes, ma'am? Yes, could you please repeat the questions before you answer them? I can't hear them. Okay. Uh, I, I will repeat that question. His question... Um, was who are the two witnesses in Apocalypse chapter 11? 
And he, and he, he made some reference to Enoch and Elijah, and, and I do know my answer to that. Okay? Yes, sir? Is it somewhere in the apocalypse where the rapture is drawn out of by the prophets? Uh, not in, well, yeah, in the Apocalypse chapter 4, in the first two verses, uh, this is the only place in the Apocalypse that they pull it out of, and those first two verses talk about John being taken up to heaven, okay, to see this vision. This whole thing that we see here is a vision that John is seeing, okay? It's like he's watching a movie, all right? And he's recording the movie as he's watching, all right? Now, these... Particular people who believe in the rapture, they say, well, when John's called up to heaven to see this vision, well, that's symbolic of the church being raptured. Okay, kind of a stretch, don't you think? Yeah, I would say so too. Yeah, not in the apocalypse. Uh, it's in another passage, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. Okay, and uh, that's about the only passage they have there. Okay? One more question, and I need to bring questions. Okay, yes, sir. I was wondering, would it be correct to, to say or even teach that um, the, that Satan fears Mary more than he fears God? That's like saying we the bond for it, but I mean, uh, is that correct, theologically, doctrinally? Uh, I don't think that would be a correct statement, no. I know it sounds radical, but he's saying it because it's not a battle between God and His Satan. question is, he's saying uh, it's more like that does he think, do we think that him. Satan is, is more frightened of Mary than he is of God? And so... I think that's essentially what you're asking. Yeah, that's, right? that's like that's a that's a good That's yeah. what I'm saying. Like, yeah, yeah, I would say no, and talk to me about that later. Sure. Okay. Quick announcement. Uh, Take uh, while he's talking in his next presentation, Dr. Uh, brother Frank Water, will you stand up? He's going to be coming around quietly and selling raffle tickets. Uh, very quietly, so it doesn't interrupt the talk. Uh, they're going to be dollar a piece, Frank, and five for three dollars. And we have a bunch of uh, prizes in the back that you can peruse also uh, quietly during these short breaks. And uh, I think we had one more question that was, somebody had their, it's for Dr. St. Dennis. Yes. Okay, I'll be up there in a second. Yeah. Right? Did you say one thing that we have single roll of tickets? Okay, single roll of tickets. So when Frank comes around, write your name on the back of the ticket, please. I should have told me you didn't see these numbers from back there. You can't see the red from back there. Yeah, you can't see the red. Don't be shy. You've got to tell me these things. Okay. Was that a pretty good synopsis of, of the book there? In about 40 minutes? There's a question over here. Yes. Yes, I had never heard of that analogy of the four horsemen. Uh -huh. The white horse in the front. Um, if I if I heard you correctly, then you were saying that the white horse in the beginning conquer was symbolic of Jesus in the gospel. Yes. Why then would the the revelation of John go into detail explaining Christ's actual appearance with uh, a few chapters later with the uh, you know uh, sword of fire coming out of his mouth, uh, laying waste with words, when it has a symbolic appearance here? Uh, I'm confused because it seems that, that in that interpretation there's two appearances of Jesus when one is clearly stated. Yeah, well, they're both symbolic because if you have a sword protruding out of your mouth, <laughs> if you have a sword protruding out of your mouth, that's symbolic. Okay, and that's in, in Apocalypse chapter 19. Okay, in Apocalypse 6, uh, you got this symbolism of the white horse. Okay, now remember, as I said, each of these are compartmentalizing the first and second coming of Christ. So we would expect Jesus to appear in both of them, or all seven of them, actually. And he does. He just appears in different symbols because he has a different message to give us. Make sense? I understand. Okay. okay. All right. Yes, sir. I just, you, you had mentioned, um, very quick question, why doesn't the first section have the ending, the second coming, yeah, you kind of glossed by that. I, I yeah, because this is an introduction, basically. Okay. It's dealing with the seven churches. Right. There, you got the number seven again, okay? And in each of the seven churches, Jesus says, these are the things you have wrong with you. You either repent or I will come back in judgment. 
Now that's the same theme that we see here, you see, except it's extended a little bit through the chapters. This is your problem, okay? Right here. I'm going to come back in judgment if you don't straighten up. And then the final judgment if you don't clean up after that judgment, you see. Same thing he says to them in each of the seven churches of chapters 1 to 3. Okay? So we do have that, and I make a point of that in the book. Each church has Jesus coming. And it uses the same word coming that it uses in the, in the rest of the chapters. Okay? All right. Anybody else? Yes, sir? Did I mishear miss uh, a statement to the effect that the reign of David began in 1000 A.D.? I said around, possibly. A. 1000 A.D. or around there, yeah. I'm sorry, B.C. Not A.D., B.C. <laughs> Thank you. A.D. <laughs> okay. We're going to start the second talk here in just a moment. Uh, it's all right to look uh, at things while he's talking, but please keep the talking down so the people that are listening to the talk can hear it, please. Thank you. Okay. Nobody have any more questions? Not all. Race all this? Yes, ma'am? How about the famous 666? How about it? Well, the way we combat it is every time that they've told us who the identity of the 666 is, they've been wrong. Okay? Because that person is coming on. They basically they have died. Okay, everybody from Nero to Mussolini to Hitler to whoever, they've all gone by the wayside. And we're still, Jesus still has to come back here. Okay? So that's why uh, it's, it's really dangerous to get too detailed in these things, as I was saying at the beginning, you see. And normally the number 666 is taken as a symbolic representation of Satan's trinity, okay? You know, we have 777 used in the apocalypse for, for the trinity. Seven is basically God's number. Well, six is the devil's number, okay? So you have three sixes. That's why you have the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet in uh, Apocalypse chapter 11. Okay? They all have their jobs to do, but basically you have a trinity of, of satanic power. Okay? Uh, once the dragon is gone, the beast takes over, and then the beast uses the false prophet. And he, the false prophet comes with his anti-gospel looking just like Christ. That's it. That's how the beast seduces the whole world, as it says in Apocalypse 13, verse 5. Okay? The dragon represents Satan when he was uh, de uh, defeated at the cross. And that's why the beast has to take over. The dragon is chained, but the power still continues because the dragon gives his power to the beast. Okay? So you have this trinity of the devil operating. Okay? So, uh, but you can get more detail of that in the book. Yes, sir, one more question. Yeah, one more question. Because the way those numbers are used in the Bible, uh, whenever the set number seven is used, it usually is in a context referring to God or His power or His perfection. When the number six is used in certain contexts, the devil is in the context, okay, or the, the demonic angels or something evil, okay, or mankind can also be included in that as well. So that gets into a little bit more detail that we can't get into right now, but, the, but it all is covered in the book for you, okay? All right, well, let's get on to our next topic.